Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul, and so be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore... I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he was poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made the intercession for the transgressors. As we read Isaiah 53, we see the promise of the Lord God, the God of Israel, that he made to his people. Isaiah 53 speaks clearly of the death and the sacrifice of Jesus our Savior in whom we today worship and remember. It is in Matthew chapter 26 that we see in verse 26 that Jesus prepared a meal before his time in the Garden of Gethsemane, before his arrest and his betrayal. But Jesus in this meal had one focus what the meal represented. It wasn't the final meal of a dead man walking or the final meal requested of a man who was on death row. This was a meal that would typify the very body and blood and sacrifice of Jesus. As we consider what Jesus said to the disciples there in Matthew chapter 26 in verse 26, the Bible says that Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples and he said these words to them, take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. The Bible says in the same manner, he also took the cup and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And with that, he also commanded them to drink from it. Paul reminds us that as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup in 1 Corinthians 11, we proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. There is a proclaiming of Jesus' death, and that's what we're going to do. I'm reminded of what Mark's gospel reveals to us concerning Jesus' time. And today we're hearing you probably wonder, why do we gather at noon for a time of communion? When communion was a meal that took place before Jesus' arrest and betrayal. Well, what we're seeing in Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 25 through about verse 
35 and 36, we see Jesus' entire time on the cross. Notice what it says here. It says this. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. The inscription of his accusation was written above the king of the Jews. With him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left, so that the scripture was fulfilled which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. We just read that in Isaiah 53. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking among themselves with the scribes said he saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Notice that it says that they would only believe if he took himself off of the cross in his own doing. The Bible is very clear according to John's gospel in chapter 10. Jesus uses these words in regards to his life and the cross. In verse 18, Jesus says, No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. They desired Jesus to take himself from the cross in order for them to believe. Remember the statements also found in John's Gospel in chapter 20 where Jesus has met with the disciples in the upper room. And remember the words that took place. As we see in chapter 20 in verse 26, it says, And after eight days, the disciples were again inside, and Thomas being with them, Jesus came, the doors being shut, stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands, and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Now remember, an important point that's being made here is they said if he were to take himself from the cross, we would believe. Jesus didn't take himself from the cross because Jesus laid down his life. And Jesus said, for those who believe and don't see, blessed are they. That's speaking about you and me. We didn't see the crucified Savior. We didn't see what Thomas saw. What we have seen is what the scripture has made known to us and that the gospel is revealed to our hearts. That Jesus truly is the Messiah that is spoken of in Scripture who died for our sins. And we also see here that he's the one who paid the price that you and I could never pay. The Bible then says, now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And in the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabbatani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood when they heard that said, look, he is calling for Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink, saying, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and take him down. Jesus cried with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out with his last breath, and he said, truly, this man was the son of God. Now, what I think is a couple of things that we have to take in and consider as to why we're gathering. And that is this. If you follow from verses 25 as I just read to you here to verse 39, you'll notice that Jesus was placed and crucified on the cross at 9 a.m. What were you doing at 9 a.m. this morning? What were the thoughts? What were the motives of your heart? 
over 2,000 years ago, your Savior was being nailed to a cross at 9 a.m. The Bible says in verse 33, now when the sixth hour had come, the sixth hour is noon. As we assembled ourselves in here and began to worship the Lord, Jesus had already been on the cross for a couple of hours. Notice what I think is interesting. We see then in the very same verse it says that there was darkness over the whole land. Something I noticed this morning is that the sun wasn't shining bright. It was actually a cloudy morning. The first thought that came to my mind is there was cloud, a cloud and um, darkness that covered the whole land when Jesus was at Calvary's cross. And why was there darkness? Well, this was to fulfill, I believe, a prophecy of Amos chapter 8 and verse 9. The Bible says then the whole land had this darkness until about the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m. And then ultimately we see that at evening in verse 42, they had come because it was preparation day, the day before the Sabbath. So this is where Jesus's body was taken down, probably around five in the evening before Shabbat would start at 6 p.m. Jesus was actually on the cross from about 9 a.m. till about 5 p.m. Talk about a real nine to five. Not for himself, but for you. There are a couple of things that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 27 in verse 46. The Bible tells us that about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, these words, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabbatani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what was Jesus doing here? Well, we see that he was expressing his feelings of abandonment. As God placed the sins of the world on him. And because of that, God had to turn away from Jesus. As Jesus was feeling that weight of sin, he was expressing the separation from the Father. The only time in all of eternity that the father and son were separated as a result of sin. In Psalm 22 in verse 1, this was the fulfillment of this prophetic statement of David as he wrote this psalm. The Bible also says in Luke's gospel, in chapter 23 in verse 34, Jesus says these words from the cross, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Remember, those that crucified Jesus, they were not aware of the full scope or the weight of what they were doing because they did not recognize him as the Messiah. With their ignorance of divine truth, they didn't deserve this forgiveness. But Jesus' prayer in the midst of them mocking him, saying, have him take himself down. Don't give him any aid. Let's see if Elijah comes for him. They mocked him saying, you who say you will destroy the temple and in three days you will raise it up again. Let him save himself. And all of this, we see their mocking and their disgrace to Jesus. But yet we see Jesus's limitless compassion of divine grace as he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 43, another statement that Jesus made on the cross, and that is, I tell you the truth, today you'll be with me in paradise. In this passage of scripture, we see something really important, and that is one of the transgressors, as Isaiah 53 says, that he would be with the transgressor, the thief on the cross. We know the story very well. And this criminal recognized Jesus. He asked Jesus that if Jesus would remember him when he goes into his kingdom, he acknowledged that Jesus was more than just a man who was being crucified. In his own words, the thief said that Jesus was innocently crucified. And the criminal himself said, we are deserving of this death and being here. Jesus then looked at him and said, today you'll be with me in paradise. This was granted to this man, even at the hour of his death, because the criminal had expressed his faith in Jesus, recognizing him for who 
he was. At this time, we see much is being said concerning Jesus and his statements on the cross. Remember, Another statement that we read here that Jesus made on the cross, he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, Luke chapter 23 and verse 46. In other words, Jesus here willingly gave up his soul into the Father's hands, indicating that he was about to die. But it also means that God had accepted the sacrifice. He offered up himself unblemished to God. This is what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And Jesus looked mercifully upon his mother. In John chapter 19 and verse 26 and 27, Jesus made another statement. And this statement here is he says, dear woman, here is your son. And he says, son, here is your mother. When Jesus saw his mother standing at the foot of the cross and he's seen the disciple, the apostle John, whom Jesus loved, Jesus put his mother Mary in the care of the apostle of love. And one of the beautiful things that we can consider on the cross is that the cross and Jesus' sacrifice is not only where physical family is renewed, restored, and made whole, but spiritual family is made. We are brought together by the blood of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. We also see the agony of Jesus' pain. As he said in John chapter 19 and verse 28, I am thirsty. Jesus made this statement as he said, I thirst in fulfilling Psalm 69 in verse 21. As the psalmist says, they gave me poison for food and for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. By this saying, Jesus was revealing that he was feeling the full weight, the full weight of all that he would endure physically for us. But yet Jesus did not partake. He endured the cross, despising the shame, the shameful death, being crucified as a criminal, but yet he was innocent. But our sin was upon him. I think today we can all agree that we deserved what Jesus got at Calvary's cross. But Jesus, in turn, took upon not only our sin, but Jesus also took upon the blows of wrath that we deserved from God because of our sin. And it doesn't stop there. Jesus didn't stop midway and Jesus didn't say, let's pause or let's wait. Jesus didn't run from the crucifixion. Jesus withstood it, endured it, because the Bible says, who for the joy that was set before him. I don't know anybody that's in the midst of pain that can see joy. Only Jesus can. Why? Because Jesus knows the outcome. He knows what will transpire as a result of all this. The Bible says this in verse 2 of Hebrews chapter 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy that was set before him. You and I today are that joy. So we can have joy because Jesus... And what he did for us. The final statement that we read here that Jesus made is found in John chapter 19 and verse 30. Jesus' final words on the cross were, it is finished. It meant that Jesus' suffering was over and the whole work of salvation. Jesus being the propitiation for our sin the sacrifice, all that God had given him to do, which was to preach the gospel, to work miracles, to obtain salvation for his people. It was done. It was accomplished. It was fulfilled. And the debt of sin was paid. Jesus utters these words, it is finished, and the statement in and of itself means the debt has been paid in full. So today, we worship Jesus 
Because in no way did Jesus turn around, look any other way, or in any way resist. He willingly, like he said in John 10, 18, nobody takes it from me, I lay it down. And today, we are blessed to know that Jesus truly laid it down for us. The Bible says no greater love will a man ever know than one who lays down his life for his friend. And that's what we're gathering here today, to reflect on that, to receive all that the Lord has for us, that we can worship the Lord at the table of communion. Now, as we reflect over 2,000 years ago, Jesus is on the cross. Today, 2,000 years later, we remember him. We remember the sacrifice that at the very hour in which Jesus was on the cross, as it says here, and darkness began to go over the whole land. And as Jesus was there with our sin on him, we now today partake in communion and say, yes, Jesus, you died for our sins. But you know what else the Bible says? Both Jesus and Paul say, Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 29. He says, For I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And with that, we see that Jesus says communion is not just looking back over 2,000 years on the time in which I was on the cross. Communion is also looking to that great glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, which we're about to do, till he comes. Communion is always looking back to Calvary, but looking ahead to that glorious appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this time. We ask God that our hearts would be prepared as we're led in communion, Lord, may we not forget the sacrifice that was made. May we not forget, Lord, the price that was paid. Lord, that your will would be done in our lives. So, Father, we look to you now as we remain in an attitude of worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. But, you know, as I was, as I was looking at communion and, and Pastor David said I'd be leading it, I really dug into this if you can envision right now Jesus is is at this small table with his disciples and they're sitting and they're leaning on each other and if you understand about what was taking place at this Seder meal there's four cups that are taken in the Seder meal the first cup is the cup of sanct sanctification the second cup is a cup of deliverance or judgment the third cup, ah, the third cup, that's the important cup for us because that's the cup of redemption. And when, it, when I was looking at this and, and I, I was studying last night and really digging into this, and I was looking here at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and Paul writes in beginning at verse 23 where the Lord's Supper is institute, uh, instituted here, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus would have gave a Hebrew prayer, and he would have said something like, Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Jesus he told the scribes and Pharisees, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will make it rise again. The Bible says God raised him, the Holy Spirit raised him. All three raised him from the dead. And it's amazing because then he takes his cup. If you envision Jesus sitting there and he's doing this, they would have already partaken of two cups. However, the second cup, Jesus wouldn't have partaken of the second cup. The disciples did because it was for deliverance. They were delivered from what? From Egypt. And they were remembering that deliverance. But Jesus didn't partake of the second cup. 
And it was because, see, later on, he would go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he would go and he would, the Bible says that the cup of the wrath of God was poured upon him. And we know when Jesus was there, he was, he was praying, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, your will be done. Pastor already said that he did it willingly. He gave his life willingly. And it said while he was there, droplets of blood formed and were dropping to the ground. That is a medical phenomenon when you're under extreme stress. But then it says here, after they broke this, the bread, and he said, do it in remembrance of me. Then he said, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the cup, is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. That's the third cup in the Seder meal. And how beautiful that we're going to partake in this, this afternoon. And I'm envisioning Jesus again with his disciples. And he's telling them about this third cup. And they're taking this third cup. And I'm thinking, how beautiful, what a picture it is for us of what he did on the cross. And then he goes on and he says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes, his second coming. See, just as Passover celebrates deliverance from slavery for the children of Israel from Egypt, so the Lord's Supper celebrates deliverance of sin by Christ's death. So Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. How do we rem remember? We remember Christ in the Lord's Supper by thinking about what he did and why he did it. Further, the remembering has both a backward and forward look. We remember Christ's death, and we remember that he's coming again. See, if the Lord's Supper becomes, becomes just a ritual, then it loses all its significance. But when we appreciate what Christ has done and anticipate what he will do when he returns, the Lord's Supper takes on a profound sense of purpose. So take time right now as we go to prayer to get spiritually ready for communion it's going to be open communion and as pastor always announces come out from the sides or i think the ushers are going to you're going to pass out the elements okay we got it already see i missed it see pastor i'm new <laughs> but when we uh again we need to be spiritually ready for communion gratefully recalling what jesus lovingly lovingly sacrificed himself for you and me see let the reality that your sins are forgiven let it motivate you to love and serve him a lot better because of that finished work of the cross so as we partake this afternoon remember this is the third cup that he would have partaken in that day let's pray Father in heaven, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, thank you, Lord, for allowing your body to be broken for us. Lord, I can envision this right now in my mind. How beautiful, what a picture. Willingly, Lord, even though you were in agony, knowing the wrath of the sins of the world that were going to be poured upon your shoulders, you willingly gave your life. Just like John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We thank you, Lord, for this bread that we're about to partake, representing your body that was broken for us. Thank you, Lord. We love you, we praise you, and we honor you. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Let's partake. And in the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father in heaven, the 
God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. That prayer, blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine. You are the vine, we are the branches. Without you, we could do nothing. Without your precious blood, there would be no salvation. So Lord, we thank you that you willingly allowed your blood to be shed for us so that we could be made white as snow. So Lord, we thank you, we love you, we praise you, and we honor you. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Let's partake. You know, in one of the other Gospels, the fourth cup, the cup of joy, they sang, and imagine, Jesus knows where he's going. He's going to the cross. But yet, they sang a hymn in praise to the Lord. So we're going to have the worship team sing a song, just like they would have done after they were done with the Lord's Supper. Amen? Amen.